another thing that authors do to try to help us kind of have a feeling of completion at near the end of a story is to bring something back that they talked about at the beginning. And way back on page two, looking sort of fierce is how I remember him. Except later it was Freak himself who taught me that remembering is a great invention of the mind. And if you try hard enough, you can remember anything, whether it really happened or not. Keep that in mind when we read chapter 22 and listen to that title. Chapter 22. Remembering is just an invention of the mind. Spring has sprung, Freak says, and so are we. This is the day school gets out, and we're taking the long way home. By now I've been carrying him around on my shoulders for almost a year. We call it walking high, and even if we haven't been going on as many dangerous quests lately, so the fair Gwen won't have to throw a fit, Freak hasn't exactly given up on slaying dragons. The world is really and truly green all over, he says. Do you remember what it used to be like back in the Ice Age, where the glaciers covered the earth and the saber-toothed tiger roamed the frozen night? Uh, no, I say. How can I remember that? I wasn't even born. Don't be a pinhead, he says. Remembering is just an invention of the mind. And I go, what's that supposed to mean? It means that if you want to, you can remember anything, whether it actually happened or not. Like I can read what it was like in the Ice Age. I keep trying to invent stuff, the wheel, central heating, indoor plumbing. But the Neanderthals were happy with just a campfire and a fur coat. If you guess that Freak has been reading a book about the Ice Age, you're right. He's been seeing a saber-toothed tiger behind every bush, except so far, all of them have turned out to be stray cats. Or this once it was a skunk, and it's a good thing I can run fast, or we'd have to soak in tomato juice, which is the only way to get rid of that stink. Inventing electricity would be tough, he says, without copper wire and magnets, but I can handle inventing a compass. All you have to do is rub the needle. That way everybody could head south and get away from the glaciers. First you need to invent a time machine, I say, so you can go back there and give all the cavemen a hard time about indoor plumbing. Freak goes, you don't need a time machine if you know how to remember. Which is something I'll always remember. Him saying that, and me trying to figure it out. Freak's birthday is a couple of days after school gets out, and the fair Gwen has already made it clear he's not getting a ride on the space shuttle. Thirteen is supposed to be extra special, he says. The least you can do is get my name on the list. Or how about a linear accelerator? Just a small one so I can split a few atoms. The fair Gwen goes, I suppose this means you're going to be an obnoxious teenager? The deal is, this is really two birthdays for the price of one, because Freak the Mighty is almost a year old. Talk about a prodigy, Freak says. One year old and he's already on his way to ninth grade. The fair Gwen just rolls her eyes when we talk like that. Freak says we can't expect her to understand because you can't really get what it means to be Freak the Mighty unless you are Freak the Mighty. Anyhow, the party is just a family affair because Freak isn't supposed to get overexcited, which is like saying the moon isn't supposed to go around the earth. Last year I got the ornithopter, he says. This year, why not a helicopter? A real one. Uh, you can't expect a teenager to play with toys. Why not a jet plane? The fair Gwen says. Cool, a Learjet! What he's really getting, and I've been sworn to secrecy, is this new computer, the one he's been drooling over in his computer magazines. It comes with a modem, which means if he has to stay home for some reason, he can go to school over the telephone. You know how sometimes I ask you if you can relate to something in the story? The idea is I'd be in there in the classroom with a matching computer. The only problem... I don't know squid about computers. You'll look, learn, the fair Gwen says. Kevin will teach you. But why would he have to stay home? I ask her. We're out in the kitchen and she and Graham are frosting the cakes and Freak is hanging out in the living room acting like he intends to have a party every day for the rest of his life. Maybe we won't. he won't have to stay home, the fair Gwen says. And she and Graham kind of lock eyes for a second. That secret code that mothers have. This is just in case, Max. I think maybe he already guessed about the computer, I say. That's why he's jerking your chain about the space shuttle ride and the Learjets. I'm not surprised, the fair Gwen says. You can't keep anything from Kevin. 
Freak hardly touches his supper. He says he's saving his appetite for the cake, and finally when we're all done eating except for Grim, who keeps rubbing his belly and rolling his eyes and telling the fair Gwen what a genius she is with fresh peas and new potatoes and salmon, and he'll have just a smidgen more, thanks, until finally Graham clears her throat and smiles, and Graham has to apologize for being such a pig. The funny thing is, when at last they do bring out the cake, Freak asks me to flame out the candles while he makes his wish, and then he doesn't even touch his piece. He just sort of pushes it around on the plate. I figured he's so excited about getting the new computer that he's lost his appetite. Not that he's letting on he doesn't feel good. He's acting just as wise and smart-mouthed as ever. I should have asked for earplugs, he says when we're done singing Happy Birthday. You better check the glassware for cracks. Hush up, the fair Gwen says, or we'll sing you another chorus. When she brings out the computer, he acts so surprised and happy, maybe he really is surprised. Right away, he wants to turn it on and show off what a brain he is. And because it's his birthday, we all have to sit there and admire him and go, Ooh, amazing, fantastic, and Kevin, how did you know that? And so on. He's showing Grimm how to play 3D chess, and just watching him makes me dizzy. So after a while, I go out to the kitchen and I help clean up, which is something I'm good at. Maxwell never breaks a dish, Graham is saying. He's very sure-handed for someone so large. We're almost done putting stuff away and wiping the counter when Graham shouts from the other room. All he says is, Kevin! But we can tell right away something is wrong. We run in and Freak is leaning back in his chair, making this wheezing sound, panting real fast, and his eyelids are flickering. He's having a seizure, Graham says. Call an ambulance! The fair Gwen is already on the phone. I run out in the street and start waving my arms and jumping up and down so they'll know where to stop, and I keep running back in the house to check on things, but the fair Gwen says there's nothing we can do except wait. <laughs>